So the room is full. I think we should proceed. Um, doors are closing. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Um, so I have two minutes to do some advertising. No, that won't last two minutes. But um, I'm the CTO of Blackfire, which is a profiler, a PHP profiler. Uh, it is able to display and to show you what happens in your application, in your scripts, in terms of call graphs. So this is a short excerpt from a call graph. And I'm very happy today to announce um, the profiler uh, edition, which is a new way to, you know, add more features to Blackfire. So if you want to try it, it's free. And if you want to use it daily, it's also free. But if you want more features, uh, you can uh, use this coupon, uh, Profiler Launch, to get discounts on the Profiler Edition. OK, let's go. <laughs> so uh, the topic of today is mastering dependency injection in Drupal 8. Um, I'm Nicolas Grecas. Uh, I'm French. I work at Sensio Labs in Paris. Uh, so I work for Blackfire also, which is a business unit of Sensio Labs. Sensio Labs uh, is the company that is behind the Symfony framework, so Symfony components also. Uh, it has been founded by Fabien Potentier, uh, which you may, you may have heard of uh, because he leads the Symfony and the open source community there. Um, I have quite some time. Uh, Fabien allows me to work on Symfony and to hack on Symfony, so uh, I'm quite active contributor now. Um, and that's it for the presentation. Um, don't hesitate to tweet and give feedback at the end of the conference, during the conference. Uh, it's very important for all speakers here and for the Drupal Association, you know, to give the good speakers and rate them. Um, so um, I have a lot of code in my slides, so I hope you won't be too uh, scared of them. Um, let's talk about design uh, design pattern, yes. So the dependency injection design pattern that uh, four words, uh, you know, uh, um, maybe overloaded and too complex for what they are really. So um, let's say we have a user. Um, this is a really simple user class and our user uh, has a language property. So we are able to store in which language this user wants to uh, see the pages. So we have a method set language and of course it's just a set, a very, very basic one. Uh, so to use that user class, we instantiate it with user again new user, then set language, and then we have an English user, English speaking user, or at least reading. Um, now let's say we'd like to store the language of this user in the session. So let's create a session storage, which is just a wrapper around PHP sessions. Uh, so we have a constructor with a cookie name. Um, the cookie name, it's, this, is, this is the default of uh, PHP also. So PHP says ID. We use session name, which is the PHP function to uh, set the name of the cookie for storing session. And we start the session. Then uh, our cookie storage has a setter, which is, OK, set this key with this value for this key for in the session, and that's it. OK, so that's just a plain wrapper. A wrapper. Let's use it um, in our uh, user class to store across pages the preferred language of our user. Um, so um, this is a way to do it. Uh, let's say our user needs the storage, of course. So let's um, have it as a property built in the constructor of our object. So we now we have a storage as a private property. Uh, and when we set the language, in fact, we store the language value in the session, in the language property. Right, straightforward, I guess. Um, and to use it, exactly the same code here. We say new user, set language, English, and now this will persist across pages. OK, now we have some issues with this code. Um, in terms of, you know, decoupling uh, reusability, how do I create a user that uses a different cookie name? So as you remember, the session storage has a parameter, cookie name, and the default value is PHP says ID. And now this is hard coded, into, hard coded into the user class. A user must have, with this code, a cookie name, which is called PHP says ID which might be, uh, you know, bad. We don't want that kind of hard coding into classes. Uh, another issue there 
is the session storage itself. Uh, because, you know, this is a session and this is the actual PHP session, but maybe in your um, unit test uh, suite, you'd like to not have the real session storage engine, uh, engine but you may like to have another storage, uh, some array storage, local storage, or maybe you'd like to have some, you know, memcached storage, ready storage to store the session and not use PHP native uh, system. Uh, so now that's another issue we have here. So how do we configure the storage when it's hard-coded there? We can't, okay? So for that, there is a way to do that. Um, it's just to inject the storage as a constructor argument. Now, um, I just have to configure the storage from the outside of the user class, and I give it ready, bootstrapped, to the user class when, uh, you know, instantiated it. Uh, and that's um, the code that does exactly this, okay? So we create the storage, but we could create, you know, ready storage and array storage. We could pass the uh, cookie name there and give it ready to the user class, and then it's ready. We have decoupled things, and we're ready to handle many storage engine engines. Uh, really, that's the design part. That's dependency injection. Dependency injection uh, just means, you know, not instantiating uh, hard coding things into your classes, but really giving them ready to your classes, to your own class. And that's it. Um, now, so we have the concept. Let's get deeper into that. Um, so back to our uh, user class, we have the storage here. Um, as you can see, there is a type issue there. There is nothing that um, guarantees you that storage is actually a session, um, a session storage, which means it could be an array, could be a string, could be anything. Um, so there's a way to enforce that, which is just to type hints uh, using PHP type hints. So let's say we created some session storage interface. This could just define our set method. And then in this case, we are sure now uh, that the storage will be and must be something that we can deal uh, from the user class point of view, deal with it, okay? Um, now we have um, other way to do um, dependency injection. So um, I showed you constructor injection because we just injected the storage into the constructor, but we can of course use setter injection. So in this case, we, I, we added some set storage method on the class and now we just have to call, you know, the set storage method to configure the session uh, storage for this user class. The third and only uh, last way to inject a dependency into some class is to use a public property. So no method, just a public property. Uh, I just wanted to show you that, but you shouldn't do it because you don't have any type hints there. You don't know, you, there's no extension point, so there is nothing you can hook and it's not uh, extendable and reusable. Um, so constructor injection is better than setter injection, which is itself far better than uh, property injection. Uh, setter injection has an issue. Uh, which is that it makes the object, the user class, mutable, which means you can call set storage several times and you just change, uh, you just change yes, the storage, which can be an issue. Uh, with constructor injection, you are sure, uh, if you don't do some crazy hacks, you are sure that the storage will remain the same uh, from the beginning to the end of the request cycle. Okay, so it's rule of thumb, uh, dependency injection as a design pattern is like never writing new in your code. If you see new something, then it means there is a possibility for uh, maybe using dependency injection instead of hard coding um, this very class that you instantiated, like our new session storage at the beginning. Um, and Dependency injection is for adding, you know, behavior and features to your objects. Um, so that's the, um, you know, asterisk at the bottom. 
um, you also will deal with uh, data objects. So for example, a daytime PHP plain uh, daytime object, this is fine to do, to do into your class, uh, you know, dates or now equals new daytime because daytime is really a data object. It's just a proper for state and for date. And you don't want to inject the date as a dependency because you don't care about that. You just want to have some, you know, uh, value holder uh, object. So you, it's fine for data object to have new in your code, but really for anything else, you should think twice and say, okay, uh, this is a new, I, I'm just reading a new in my code, maybe there's something uh, wrong, maybe I can decouple it and make it more testable, more reusable, easier to review, uh, you know, uh, more focused also on its own and very responsibility, things like that. That's it. So dependency injection allows you to make code reusable, testable, uh, pluggable, loosely decoupled, you know, many uh, words we like. Uh, let's um, construct on the concept. So this could be a dependency graph, or this shows some alternatives that we can um, have when dealing with our user class. So at the top we have the user class, and the user class needs a session storage interface of any kind. So that's uh, the name of the interface in green. And then let's say um, we could have a session storage. Um, so the first or the second class uh, in the slides. Um, this session storage itself has a dependency, uh, which is not an object, it's a string, it's the name of a cookie. Uh, we could have the array storage, of course, uh, which is perfectly valid from the user point of view. The user point of view really doesn't care about whether it's a session storage, an array storage, or maybe in this example, a Redis storage. So Redis is a database, um, in-memory database, uh, that is really fast and really, you know, suited for storing um, session and other things, but for session in this case. So let's say we, need, we have some Redis storage that implements the session storage interface. And let's say maybe that this Redis storage needs itself a Redis connection, which is something that you know PHP or some PHP extension can provide. So that's another object. And I'm sure the Redis connection object itself needs to be, you know, uh, to get some Redis host, which is the server where's, where Redis is listening, so local host or something else. Um, so as you can see, uh, with dependency injection, we start to have dependency trees, reverse dependency trees. So I need a user. Okay, to get a user, you first need to, to get a storage. Oh, it's a Redis storage, then you need to build a Redis connection. And then, okay, first you just give me the Redis host. And this is a chain. And um, if you think, and if you build your, your framework and your application on this concept, you will get a big tree of dependencies. Uh, and if you need, for example, logger, let's say you, the logger uh, service is an object that implements something, but maybe the logger needs a database if, if you'd like to log in the database, and so on. So all services have dependencies. Uh, and for, to, to deal with that, um, we need something, some code, that knows how to create a Redis connection, a Redis storage, a session storage, uh, maybe a user. Um, so we need recipes for you know new session storage. I, this is needed as first argument of the uh, user class and so on. Um, so we need these recipes, um, and we also need some you know registry of uh, services because. Um, in some page, in some uh, application, you uh, want to have only one session. This is the user session of the current request. You need to have one logger so that all the feature, all the code that need to log uh, get this same, very same instance of the logger you're going to use uh, everywhere in your application. So where should we you know, uh, index or uh, register this uh, list of objects that are useful and provide features to your applications. Um, that's where we need the dependency injection container. So now we are talking about an actual object. 
uh, until now I was I was speaking about you know dependency injection as a design pattern so it's a concept and it's a really simple one just injecting things instead of creating them inside the classes now I'm talking about an actual object something we can uh, read as code and create uh, with a new keyword uh, so the dependency injection is an object that has all the recipes to create the actual object so um, and in fact that has all the object of your application recursively because you know we have this tree in mind so that I need a session okay you need a connection okay you need a Redis storage okay I know how to do them and I know how to wire them um, so that uh, the logger is injecting it into the Redis storage if we'd like to do that um, the container knows everything about that and you're going to tell and to teach uh, it how to do that um, we call that, I already used that word, the services. So the services are, are really the useful object that the, containers, the container uh, knows about. Only that, actual objects. Okay? Okay, let's start. Um, this is a container. The container um, has a get method. And it takes a string as an argument, which is the nickname of the object you'd like to get. So let's say, container, give me the database. And the container knows how to build this object um, because it has a recipe for this database string uh, in its configuration. Um, Drupal uh, ships uh, with uh, a few hundred uh, services, so a few hundred recipes and nicknames for uh, features that are ready for you to be used uh, into, uh, you know, the container. So this is a short excerpt and in the next slides I'm going to, you know, uh, take them not one by one, but uh, the general ideas, um, focus on one type of definition uh, and all the kind of definition you can use to create recipes and to give them a name. Okay, so the simplest recipe is uh, this one. So this recipe says, uh, let's um, create a service which we call serialization.json, so it's just a string. And uh, this service is just an instance of the Drupal component serialization JSON class. And that's it. If I give you, I give you this recipe, you can say, you, you know, and because you also, uh, you know that um, to create this service, so serialization.json, you just have to create an object with new Drupal component serialization JSON. So um, this is the kind of code that could be uh, generated for the container to just return the serialization.json object. So let's say we wrap it in, into some, you know, um, getter, and the code for creating this object is the last line, new Drupal component serialization JSON, which is exactly the same string as in the definition. And we put that into the this services array. So this is the container, and the container just, you know, stores uh, this new object into the internal array. So that whenever you call get on the public surface, the container can just call this method when the service no, is not ready, get the object and reuse it the next time for you, okay? So let's make it a bit more complex slides after, after slides. Um, let's say we need now a service which we call state. Um, it's missing indentation. Uh, there's a missing indentation in the class and arguments uh, parameter. So class, same thing. Um, that's the class of the state object, state service, in fact. And in this case, um, the constructor needs one argument. And this argument, so if it were to need several, you know, there are the brackets, so comma, second argument, comma, third argument. Uh, and then the first argument is a service, is another service. Uh, this is the add symbol that say that. So this is saying to the container, 
uh, to build a state service just creates a new Drupal core state, state object with the key value service injected as first argument. And of course, uh, it has to know how to build a key value service in another line of the same file. So this is the kind of code that um, the container uh, could generate. So in this case, we say new Drupal core state state argument, this container gets key value. Okay, and this is where, you know, things can be recursive and you can trigger several gets uh, when you need the state service in this case. Continue. Okay, so uh, we talked about setter injection um, on our user class. So this is another example of setter injection. So that's the definition for it. Uh, let's say we have a service which is called URL generator dot non bubbling. Um, I took example from the actual core dot service dot YAML file which exists in Drupal. Uh, they're not the latest version, so yeah, it, uh, they look almost the same. So our service is an instance of, should be an instance of the Drupal core routing URL generator. It takes some arguments. Um, public, let's uh, give me a minute to talk about that. Calls, calls is the list of, you know, method that should be called uh, for building this object. So this tells new, uh, the code generated should be new Drupal corona then on the resulting instance, set context with a first argument, which is router.request context service. A few comments there. Um, as you can see, there is, um, you know, an interrogation mark after the at. This tells the container that whenever the service root, router.request context doesn't exist, then it should inject the null, null value. Because it's possible that, you know, in some definition, you use consume some service, but this service is not defined because you know configuration uh, has disabled some part, some features of the application, and disabling them means the the service uh, this feature might uh, define are not there. So um, this class should be able to deal with both a router request context instance and the null value. Um, so about public now. So public false, by default, um, in Drupal 8 and in Symfony, all services are public. Public means you can, you can get them uh, from the container. So it's our container get database from the beginning. Database is there because it's a public service. Um, if we uh, set a service as you know, private, it means that you can't fetch it from the outside of the container. You can container get URL generator dot non bubbling, you will get some error because it's pure internal thing. Uh, how is it useful? Because you can use this string to inject, uh, to use it as a dependency uh, to other services. So when doing the definition, you can create services that don't exist from the outside but are still injected into some other dependency um, for building them, okay? That's the kind of code, and uh, as you can see, I didn't lie. So the first uh, thing is create our new Drupal URL generator with the arguments. Then if there is a router.request context service, so it's a new method in the container, then uh, we call the set context method and we inject it the router.request context uh, service and there is a second argument on get, which is container interface null on invalid reference, which is readable enough to, you know, you know what it does. Um, and that's it for that. Let's continue. Next slide. <laughs> Another way. Um, so this is using the factory design pattern. Uh, who knows about the factory design pattern? Okay, great. So. Um, the factory design pattern is uh, a, the pattern where instantiating the object or some object is done by another function. So another function, another method. So let's say you have 
a, fun a function which is, which is called factory, then the job of this function is just to return an object it created, any kind you need, and each factory uh, returns uh, its own uh, you know, kind of object. So if we have a data database factory, uh, in this case, yes, we have a database uh, factory, which is uh, written in the database class, so that the second line, you have factory, the first argument, uh, the first um, value in the array is the name of the class of the factory, and get connection is the name of the method uh, we need to call to get, in fact, the database. So the database should be a Drupal core database connection. It takes one argument, so default, which is required by get connection. So this is Drupal uh, configuration. I don't know exactly uh, why this argument is required, but I'm sure it's because, okay, I can't tell you. It's because you have the default connection, but you also have the slave connection, so you can do, you know, uh, several connections, one for writing, the other one for reading from the database, things like that. Um, so, this is the generating code, uh, generated code is like this one. I removed, you know, the boilerplate. Uh, so, to get a database, um, PHP will call the get connection method on the database class with the default argument. That's it, that's the database design pattern. And the return value of this uh, function call should be a database connection, and we will register the container, we keep it in its registry of services. Um, another example with factories. So in this case, we have the cache.cache.default, uh, uh, which is a class, uh, um, and the class is Drupal core cache cache, cache backend interface. So this is a more advanced, uh, you know, definition for a factory. Because in fact, um, you don't, a factory doesn't have to return exactly that kind of object. I mean, by that kind, the name of a class. Uh, so ready storage or a session storage or an array storage to map with the previous slides. Um, it could just return any kind of uh, instance of you know, cache backend interface, so any kind of class that implements uh, this interface, and that would be fine. You have enough, we have enough information to know what kind of object this returns. So, our factory is now a service. So, uh, to create the cache, the default cache, in fact, we use the, another service which is called cache factory, and we call its get method on and the argument of the get method, get method method, should be just default. Okay, so that's the kind of code uh, this will generate. So this get cache factory, get default, and this should return a cache backend interface object, which we store into the cache cache dot default service registry. Yeah. Um, now, using a configurator, so that's another way to configure objects. Um, it's quite rare in practice, so uh, I just added this slide for completeness. Uh, a configurator is a design pattern where you give some method an instance of some object. So the object is already there. You already have it at hand, on, from the, on the contrary from, you know, factories, in factories it returns the object, but for configurators, uh, you already have the object and you tell some method, okay, now let please configure this method, this object for me. So uh, we have the Guzzle HTTP handle, handler stack, um, so HTTP handler stack as a service name, so uh, this uh, uses a factory so Guzzle HTTP handle stack create method, and this will return our object, our Guzzle handle stack, and on the returned instance, uh, we should call configure from the you know HTTP handle stack configurator service, and the generated code should look like this one. So we create our instance using call user func. So calling the create method on the handler stack, 
this returns the handler stack object. And then we fetch the service HTTP handler stack configurator from the container and we configure it just by calling configure. So this um, is using the mutability of the instance object. So that's why also it's not uh, you know, recommended, it's not the best practice because this design pattern implies um, that instance is mutable, which means uh, has setters, which means you know, can be uh, altered uh, at runtime, which is something that um, shouldn't happen for services. We'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, I told you that the container returns always the same instance of the logger of the database object that it created. And in fact, that's not mandatory. And the container uh, is also able to return you a different instance each time you call it. So uh, if you were to set shared false on the database object definition, service definition, then it would mean that calling container get database opens a new database connection every time, which is not what you'd like for database, but which is what you uh, need for this um, feed reader Dublin core entry, which is a service provided by uh, Drupal. So whenever you call container get feed reader Dublin core entry, you get one object. And if you call it a second time, you will get another object of the same, built uh, the same way, but still a new instance of this object. So uh, we call um, this kind of services uh, synthetic services. So this is a synthetic service because it's not sh shared and shared services are not synthetic. So shared and synthetic are the opposite words uh, in the container uh, vocab vocabulary. There are several, uh, you know, uh, feed reader and feed writer object and services defined into Drupal, and they all are not shared because I guess they are just data objects, and um, this is using the container as a factory for uh, feed reader and writer entries. Okay, let's continue. So. Um, I'd show you how you can write PHP code in YAML. Basically, that's it. Uh, by using the definition, it's just a new syntax, another syntax, declarative one, to create PHP code. And you have the YAML on top and PHP at the bottom. Now, um, it's possible to go one step further and play with the definitions themselves, saying, okay, now I deal with definition and I change them uh, in some way. So the first and easiest way to play with definitions, so a definition is, we saw only definition in YAML right now. So this is another definition for the config.storage service. And the definition and the configuration for this service is very easy. It says, I'm just an alias for the config.storage.active service, <coughs> which means just copy paste the definition that exists there, and I'm using exactly the same definition. So, and in fact, not only the same definition, but also the same object. So I'm the same, I, I'm a new name for this name. Uh, which means that the generated code is just this one. So if you ask for the config.storage service, this, call, this code will be called, okay? That's an alias, it's very useful, you know, because um, you can define several, in this case, uh, several config storage. So you say, this is config storage dot active, this is config storage dot whatever, one, two, three, four. And in your code, you can say, okay, I have several config storage ready for me, but the one I, I want to use uh, is this config storage. So at the beginning, um, in your service configuration, you say config dot storage, my config storage as alias, and this is just a matter of wait selecting quickly which of the existing definition you are really using for this service. Um, so um, I didn't talk about parameters, um, yet they are very useful and uh, there are several of them. Uh, parameters are plain 
uh, you know, uh, data, uh, PHP data. So uh, usually a string. Par a parameter can be a string, can be an array, can be any, you know, static uh, value, uh, number, scalar, uh, array of numbers of scalar, of string, and recursively, this kind of thing. So um, you have another section in these uh, service files which is parameters, and then it's just a key value store. So you store config storage, and the value of this one is in this case FUBA. And then you, cas you can use parameters uh, in string. So uh, the interpolation is uh, using the percent uh, symbol. So as you can see, we have percent config underscore storage percent, and this is just the placeholder uh, for the value that is actually set for the config storage parameter. Um, that's a really useful way to you know, configure uh, differently your uh, production uh, version and your development application. Let's say you have a parameter YAML file somewhere. Uh, in your dev, you might load some foobar uh, config storage. And in your production, you might define the parameter to something else, which is you know, uh, your more heavy uh, ready storage or something real for production use and not only some, uh, you know, development environment thing. And this should be resolved to, in this case, FUBAR. Very easy. Straightforward. Uh, okay. Abstract services. So an abstract service is a service definition that you can't instantiate, like uh, an abstract class, uh, which you can't new abstract uh, class. Uh, you, this is not possible. Uh, for service, it's the same. So in this case, we have container.tray, which is also a Drupal service. Uh, this one is abstract. You can't use it. Uh, it won't work. Um, and what it defines uh, is that um, the container tray service um, is should call um, set container with the service container as first parameter of set container, and that's the you know short excerpt of the full definition that uh, the actual service uh, will need. Um, let me show you. Um, this is not PHP code. This is uh, YAML again. So this is to show you how this is. Uh, used, and this is also a Drupal configuration. So in Drupal, there is a logger.factory service, and this is what you're going to use to, use to uh, you know, log things. Um, and this is an instance of the logger channel factory. And um, there is a setter to be uh, called on this one, and it's the setter defined in the parent definition. So parent is the keyword that say, okay, uh, copy past what's in the parent into my own definition, and that's it. So it's exactly the same as doing, you know, removing the parent line and copy pasting the calls line and put it, putting it in the logo.factory service. So it's an easy way to share um, configuration in the abstract level and to define several services that need, uh, that have a set container method and having this method take the service container, a service as first argument. So um, also the service container is the name of the, um, you know, um, service container itself. I have a question there. I see here both trait and parent, but could you use this as actual trait? So could you, in the local factory, um, use multiple traits like you would in uh, object-oriented code? OK, um, the answer is no. Okay. And that's very unfortunate. And I think that's some ID. Uh, it's a, an unusual way to use you know, parent and in service definition inheritance. Yeah. That's what I found in the definition. And that might end up as something like you say, you know, having the way, way to have traits Tray uh, definition that doesn't exist yet. Okay, so you, you actually define it as a trait, but you can only inherit. From exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But there's no type inheritance, so this is really a tray, but a single tray. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Ah, okay. 
Um, that's maybe the last example, uh, yet maybe also the more most complex to understand. Uh, let's say we have an app.mailer service. This one is virtual just for the talk. Uh, so let's say that this app mailer service is should be an instance of app bundle mailer. Let's say now that I'd like to wrap this mailer with my own mailer, another one, so some decorating mailer. Um, so uh, this is using, you know, the decoration design pattern, and the decoration design pattern is a pattern where you have a class, so let's say the decorated one, the app mailer, and you create a new class, um, so decorating mailer, which takes the decorated class as first argument to the constructor, first or any, uh, argument to the constructor, and then all the call on the public interfaces and public method on the decorating mailer should be forwarded to the wrapped instance that is stored inside the object. So this is really useful, you know, to uh, catch uh, calls to the method and do something before, something after, or something instead of when you don't call the uh, uh, decorated object. So you can do that. Uh, by using service decoration, and this is not the way to do it, because if you do that, you will just replace the definition. So by having the, the order matters. So the first uh, line defines an app.mailer service, and the second line replaces this definition. Um, not about decoration, just side note, this is a way to replace services in Drupal. If you have an existing service and you'd like to change it and to have it behave differently, just take its name, take its name, and create your own definition for this service, maybe by decoration, but maybe by replacing it completely, and you will just replace the actual object that Drupal is using. So that works for all objects and all services, which means all features in Drupal, which means also it can be dangerous, so <laughs> be careful. <laughs> um, so, okay, the way to do decoration uh, is using uh, this kind of definition. So, this defines a new service, which is app.decoratingMailer. That's the name of the new service. Um, this is then the class, our decorating mailer, and the special key is decorates app mailer. This one takes, and this is something magic. You can configure it, but by default, that's the magic. The magic is that um, this creates locally a service that is called app.decoratingMailer.inner. And this dot .inner means this is referencing the previous one, so the app mailer definition, because it takes the decorates app mailer. So this is the new name, local name, for the, uh, you know, app mailer locally. An it's an alias, yes. Yes, a local alias. Yeah, it's not a true alias because you can't use it from the outside. And it's the same for app.decorating mailer. This is the name of the service, but in your code, the goal of this kind of replacement is to use this definition as an app.mailer service, as the app.mailer service. So what this does internally is also replace the actual definition of the app.mailer uh, object by the, this app decorating mailer definition, which means this app dot decorating mailer definition should be private, usually. I didn't add it on the slide, but if I were to add public false, it would be perfect because the decorating service would be just hidden uh, from the outside and you would just have to use app dot mailer, which is really what only what you need. You don't need to care about how it has been, you know, decorated and this is not uh, important from the outside. So the generated code is very easy, and this is it. It's just creating our app.mailer service um, as a new app bundle decorating mailer, which takes our new app bundle mailer as first argument. Okay? Uh, we could have it in being, uh, be injected through th setters, of course, using calls then some setter at app decorating mailer inner, and so on. Uh, Drupal doesn't use that at all, I think, yet. Uh, it's quite new, 
So I don't think that when Drupal adopted Symfony, it existed, so that's the reason why. Um, we can do it, and I'm sure Drupal will do it internally in some future version. Um, so that wasn't the last slide. Um, that's not the last slide. That may be the last slide with code. Um, <laughs> so and now let's talk about tags. Um, in this case, we this is the way to hook into uh, you know the event system in Drupal, uh, in Drupal 8, and also in Symfony. So in Symfony and in Drupal, we have this event dispatcher service which is really an instance of container-aware event dispatcher. And this one, this service is the one responsible for dispatching events. Any, events, uh, any event that happens during the you know, re request response lifecycle uh, is handled by events and any event trigger uh, listeners. And you need a way to register your own listeners on any event. So, um, this is the way uh, the response listener is um, hook, hooked into the event dispatcher. And the way is to you is by using this tag, tags um, setting. So we have the class as usually, as usual, and we have tags, and we have a special tag which is event dispatcher. And this is by convention the name you have the tag you have to add to any service you need uh, to be. Uh, injected in the event dispatcher uh, service. How does that work? It works uh, by using uh, what we call a compiler pass. So a compiler pass is something that is uh, given to the container builder, which is you know some bootstrapping thing at the very beginning when the container uh, is created itself. So when the container is created, we give it a few compiler passes, and each compiler pass um, handle its own, you know, tags, for example. It could do other things, but there is one compiler pass that looks for all existing services that have this event subscriber tag, uh, get them, and inject them into the event dispatcher service by name. So if it won't inject them into another service, only into this event dispatcher service, it's hard-coded into the actual instance of the compiler pass that is, you know, wired at the beginning of uh, Drupal and of Symfony. So the generated code could look like that for the event dispatcher service. So the first one, it says, okay, uh, let's create a new container aware event dispatcher. I didn't add the argument, but this one needs uh, the container itself. So this is the first argument, this, that's why it's called container aware, because it needs the container to work. Uh, so we create this instance, and then by the compiler pass, um, the add subscriber service method is called several times, as many times as there are services that have the event subscriber tag attached. So the first one is our response listener. In Symfony, I looked at that yesterday, there are 26 different tags, so event subscriber, uh, cache context, I don't know them by heart, so, <laughs> um, okay. And that's the way to hook into, you know, services and inject your own. <sighs> okay, then, uh, we have all these definitions. So, uh, definitions are stored in each module. Each module comes, can come with its own, you know, mymodule.services.yaml file, which defines uh, exactly this kind of things. Uh, then the build bootstrapping process of Drupal and same for Symfony uh, creates this container builder. Uh, so th everything is verified, so that there's no mistake there. Uh, build, compiled, compiled means generating code or generating, it's not code uh, in Drupal, it's some object that is serialized into the database. Yet it's the same of, uh, kind of thing, optimized, which means you know removing private services that were not used, for example or inlining private services that um, since they can't be fetched from the outside, we can just you know, inline them and have them uh, write into the generated code. Uh, dumped, so writing in the database as PHP file. Cached, of course, because this is read once and uh, used many times 
I mean, the definition and all of that. Uh, so tags, uh, it also verifies uh, circular references because if you have a service foo that needs a service bar and if the service bar needs itself a service foo, it can't work, but still you can define this kind of thing. Um, abstract removed, parameters resolved, that's the job of the container builder uh, very early at the very uh, beginning of the, uh, you know, uh, dependency injection container uh, creation. Okay, uh, it's DrupalCon. Um, let's brew some beer. <laughs> so uh, here we have business logic. We have a brewery uh, class. This class has a list of, you know, Irish beers. Um, and uh, you can give it a number using the brew um, method and it, it will just brew that number of beers, any beer, random beers. Okay, so the brew method returns an array of, you know, number of <coughs> beers. Uh, you can define this class as a service. So let's say, um, let's create our Irish beer, beer brewery. It's just an instance of Irish beer brewery, so the same class we just saw. And um, in Drupal, we can create this kind of controller. So this is in Symfony also. Uh, this is uh, our Irish beer controller, which, um, so the target is to uh, draw a page um, in Drupal that just display that number of, uh, you know, beers, uh, brewed beers. So we have a constructor. The, construct take, the constructor takes by dependency injection a brewery. And um, then we have some action, the drink beer action. And it takes a number. Then it calls the brewery to get the beers. And we, this is a Drupal, we, you know, return type markup and markup just drank that many beers and that kind of beers. And um, there's one thing missing in this. Um, there are several, but one is, you know, the route. Um, so the control needs a route. So this is not to talk about routes, so I won't talk much about that. Uh, yet you need routing to map uh, some URL to this controller. And you also need a way to tell to Drupal that this controller needs the brewery, because we know that because we wrote the code and we have it on screen, but Drupal, you know, at runtime, it has to discover that to create this controller and to call then the drink beer method there, it needs to create a brewery. How do I create a brewery? Uh, the answer is uh, by implementing the container injection interface or extending the controller base, which is a base controller in Drupal, uh, which provides the interface, but which provides also many, you know, uh, Helpers, it's not mandatory at all, so in this case, I'm not using it. And at least the container injection interface uh, defines this public static function, create, which is a factory. So this is, again, the factory design pattern used for creating a controller. The job of this um, method is to return an instance of the current class. So new self, return new self, and then we have the container at hand there. And that's the way to get the container from a controller. Um, then we have the container. We call the get method to get our Irish beer brewery. And by the definition we just have before, we just had before, uh, the container knows how to get it. It's injected and it works. Uh, just to finish, uh, some pro tips. Um, Injecting the DIC, the dependency injection container itself, is an anti-pattern. You should not inject the container, so the service underscore container, uh, into your objects. They should get the logger directly, the brewery directly, and not the container. Uh, the controller and controllers in general are some kind of you know, exception because at some point you need to wire things and controller is the way where you know, uh, it's okay to have a container. But really, you shouldn't pass from the, con from the controller, you shouldn't pass the container to your, um, you know, model uh, objects, model classes. This would be an anti-pattern, why? Because it would make you code reliant on this god object that knows everything about your features. Just inject the feature that, the very feature, yeah, that your model object need, and so on. Um, avoid circular dependency dependencies uh, when possible. So it's possible to have foo needing bar and bar needing foo. And this is 
this can exist uh, if you have, I don't know, uh, some logger, you have a logger formatter and the logger formatter needs to get some state from the logger itself. So um, this needs a special way uh, uh, and special kind of definition. In fact, this needs setter injection because at some point you need, if you have constructor injection, you can create them at the same time. So you can create first the logger, then you can create, for example, the formatter, uh, inject the formatter into the container, uh, create the formatter, sorry, with the logger injected as constructor, and once you have the formatter, uh, add it with, for example, the add formatter uh, method on the logger if it were to exist. Um, I didn't talk about lazy services. Um, so there is a keyword which is lazy. As we were, we had, you know, public false, uh, shared false. We also have lazy. And lazy uh, is a keyword that tells the container to uh, generate a proxy class. So this needs a special, you know, composer package. It's not in Drupal by default, so that's why I didn't, uh, you know, uh, expand much on that. Uh, yet it, it's a code generator that generates a code that just uh, has exactly the same signature than the actual class you're going to decorate. And it doesn't instantiate really the object. Um, what it does is that when any method on this object is called, then at this time, it will, for example, create the database connection. So that's the way to you know, have lazy connection, lazy connection, database connection, so without having this logic into the database handling uh, layer. Services should be stateless, which means reusable. Stateless means you should never call a setter on any service object. Because uh, if you call some set um, method on it, except at bootstrapping step, but later on, if you call set, it means that the second call on this method, the second use of this service, will have the set uh, inside. So that won't be the same service and it means uh, you, you would be reliant on the order, calling order. If one first uh, call a setter, then the state has changed, and if you do the other th these things uh, the other way around, so uh, set after, then you can just mess up everything. Um, and last, uh, the dependency injection is just a tool, not the tool. Uh, it's not the God object. Don't create your application with uh, the container as a dependency. Uh, just use it to wire things and to you know, have recipes stored in one place. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions. Four minutes. Hello. Um, can I ask, uh, you said that it's a way of es essentially removing the new keyword from everything. Um, what's, is there a particular pattern for implementing repositories? So if you've got like a contact repository, would you not do new contact within that, or how how would you retrieve contacts? Oh, in for fact, example, yeah. Uh, in this case, I would uh, call new because uh, you know uh, repositories are for data objects, and data objects are fine because you know they're just data objects. They yeah, don't yeah. provide features. It's like repositories and factories. You could use it at that level. Yes, but you encapsulate that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, I'm here. <laughs>